thank you all very much uh, for coming. Um, it is uh, certainly early in the morning to digest big ideas, but this is clearly uh, a crowd of superior intelligence, and, and I might add great beauty. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, our speakers today have agreed to make their work um, uh, relevant and understandable, and I think hardest of all, entertaining in a TED Talk style format. Uh, I'm honored to be sharing this stage with two tr truly brilliant uh, minds, both highly distinguished in their fields, mathematician Ivar Eklund and astrophysicist J. Richard Bond, who is known to one and all as Dick Bond. Uh, Dr. Eklund will be speaking to us about the mathematics of planet Earth, and Dr. Bond will speak about how our very complex universe is beginning to reveal a remarkably simple glimpse into its earliest moments. And my role here uh, is to be the reporter doll, as Tom Stoddard Opera once referred to, you wind it up and it gets it wrong. Um, uh, following the presentations, I'm going to ask a few questions about how Dr. Eklund and Dr. Bond's work may affect you and me uh, in the here and now, and how the notion of creativity, which is so commonly uh, applied to the arts and sometimes exclusively applied to it, it in fact manifests itself uh, incessantly in scientific inquiry. Uh, and so in highly unscientific fashion, we've drawn straws to determine uh, that Dr. Eklund will present first. Ivar Eklund uh, held the Canada Research Chair in Mathematical Economics at the University of British Columbia from 2003 to 2011. He now lives in Paris. In fact, he's flown all the way from Paris uh, to be with us here today. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a former president of the University of Paris Dauphine, and former director of the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, one of the partners behind the Banff International Research Station or Burr's. Uh, he's written over 150 papers, 10 books on mathematics, economics, and finance. His topic today looks at how our understanding of planet Earth and mathematics developed in parallel and how each form of understanding uh, supports the other. Would you give a warm mountain welcome to Dr. Ivar Eklund? Thank you very much. Well, actually, I'll go in front of the podium so you can see me. So I am a mathematician, and we don't be afraid. So here it is. So this is my work. No, sorry. <laughs> and I'm going, so very, people always ask, what do mathematicians do besides teach? Well, I will try to convince you that mathematics is all about creativity. So I'd like to think, uh, to, for you to think uh, as mathematicians as painters. You see, a painter can be creative in many ways. A painter can paint a landscape or a portrait extremely accurately and yet be very creative in doing so. On the other end of the scale, you have a painter, he can do abstract painting, Jackson Pollock, nothing that reminds uh, correspond to reality. And it is creative also. So mathematics is that way. You can be creative by looking at nature, look at the planet Earth, for instance. And you can also be creative by creating completely different worlds, worlds that are completely beyond the physical. And we, we're going to see an example. So creativity, as always, when you talk about painting, you should begin with the old masters. So here is an old master. This old master was named ah, Eratosthenes. OK, I'm sure you never heard of him, but it's the third century BC. So that is, uh, shall we say, uh, so that's uh, all the 24 centuries ago. And he measures the circumference of the Earth. At the time when most people thought the Earth was flat. I mean, bear in mind that no question of discovery America, Australia, and so on. Eratosthenes goes around and says, well, the Earth is round, and it's exactly, the circumference is exactly 50 times the distance from Aswan to Alexandria. Alexandria and, and, and uh, Aswan are both in Egypt. What is due south of the other? And he says it is 45,000 kilometers, which is 12% off. In the ballpark, right? In the ballpark, right? 
This, uh, certainly, the known world was basically around the Mediterranean. He says it's round. Uh, he doesn't know about America, Africa, and so he just says that. And what's remarkable, he says that without leaving his desk. <laughs> he says it from his desk in Egypt. That's creativity. I think it's one of the major feats of mankind. So how does he do it? He does it with math. So here is a paint. Here is... OK, so this drawing I did myself, so it may convince you that I'm a painter, but not a draftsman. <laughs> so, but it's a picture that he actually could have drawn, right? They drew in the sand, of course, because they didn't have pen and paper. So his picture was the following. Here, he knew that at midsummer, in Aswan, 900 kilometers south, the sun was due in the zenith. It was due vertically. So it was due up there. Because he knew that on, at noon, at midsummer day, the sun would shine right down the bottom of wells. So it was due north. On the other hand, in Alexandria, at noon on the same day, the sun was not on top because they cast shadows. So he could measure, actually, the length of the shadow. So you see the sun is far away. He's due He's due up here, the vertical here, but he's not at the vertical at Alexandra, but it's farther up north. So there's a shadow. And by using elementary Euclidean in geometry, he says, here is the angle of the shadow. This angle here is the same as this angle here. And this angle is the angle. If you were at the center of the Earth, then this was the angle between Alexandria and Aswan. You would see Alexandria and Aswan at this angle. Bear in mind that no one ever has been at the center of the Earth. And if you were at the center of the Earth, you would not see Alexandra and Aswan. <laughs> yeah? But it's a, I find it a remarkable thing of human creativity. And knowing that, he says, well, this angle here I can measure. Because the same as this angle here is the same. I just measure. I have a pole, and I measure the angle. So I can measure it. And the distance between Alexandra and Aswan, well, this you can measure. And this is where his measurements got wrong, of course, because it's fine. And then he multiplies, and he finds the formula that uh, uh, this angle here is d over r. So if you know that and that, you can know that, and that's it. And that's the story, and finish the story. Beautiful. I find it the most wonderful f feats, excuse me, of human creativity. And what's more, he was believed in the sense that 15 centuries later, Christopher Columbus set sail from Spain to go where? Not to America. He goes to China and Japan to find spice because he thought the earth was round. And not only did he that, he got funding for that. The king of Spain funded him for that. So it's really the first time of venture capital. I think it's the most successful venture capital history in history. <laughs> the guy says the earth is round. Let's bet money on that. Three ships go back. You find an empire. So, really, I find it wonderful. So, this is the picture of the Earth that had by Dürer in 1515. You see, no America there yet. I don't know they don't have America. Uh, then, but now, of course, we have much better. We have this. So now it's no longer a feat. You see it. But then you go a bit farther. And now you can go and look and see what is inside. So the landscape is changing. This is my point now. These guys like a pain look at landscape. Now the landscape is changing. And we mathematicians start looking at what's inside here. And inside here it's moving, actually. It's moving at a different time scale. You know, it's, you have a mountain and stuff of that kind. And then you have this big discovery of uh, the big discovery since uh, antiquity. Really, the big discoveries we made after the Renaissance uh, from up to the 20th century, the discovery of the double infinities. The first infinity is infinity of space. At the time of uh, the ancient Greek, they thought that the Earth was round, but uh, was round or flat. But they thought of the heavens as a kind of cap over it, rotating cap. Now we think that it is infinity. It's far away. You have this idea that it's totally new in our minds, right? And uh, it and uh, in that you first discovered the planetary system. Galileo was the first one to stick a, a, a monocular up to the heaven and see that the moon had mountains and so on. And nowadays, you're going to hear about the cosmos. So this first idea, we discovered the infinity of space. We've also discovered the infinity of time. 
right? This came much later. Hutton, Hutton in 1785, Darwin 1859, came out and said, we cannot explain geology. You cannot explain biology if you do not take into account that the Earth has to be millions and billions of years old. So that's an infinity again. And so this is food for the mathematician. This is a new landscape we have. And it's a very tough landscape. You see, understanding the Earth, for instance, the rotating fluid, the continental drift. And to do that, we are very much helped nowadays by the machines. I mean, the computer has enabled us now to understand things like the motion, geological motion, and so on and so forth. So this is the picture we have up to the 20th century. And uh, what picture do you have in the 21st century? So now we go back to the landscape. So now, of course, each painter has his favorite landscape, right? Some point portraits, I put landscapes. So this is the landscape I am painting. And so, right. So I see Earth as a spaceship now. Right? If you doubt it, look at it. These are the lights at night. This is the black marble. So these are the lights. This is human presence and so on. And I say that we're a spaceship because now we're, in, we're able, we're changing the surface of the Earth, obviously, and we're changing what happens in this very interesting blue region here. And I'm interested, and there are causes for worry. Do we manage the spaceship very well or not? Well, there's a cause for worry, certainly which is uh, climate change. So for instance, I'm sh sh pulling there a very well-known picture. Uh, in 58, someone started measuring the atmospheric carbon dioxide at the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. So the measurements that go back from 58. Now, be aware of the scale, right? This is 310, this is 390. Now, uh, you have to extend it to nowadays, and now we reach, we reach 400 last May. So now we're about there. So it's an increase of, oh, how would I say, 33%, but it's regular. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's a certainly a cause for worry. So what's, that's the landscape. So what will the mathematician do about it? Well, he has to understand what's going on. So what's in the landscape? What are the trees? What are the beings? And so on. So you have to understand, to understand the climate. You have to understand the physics. And there are many factors in terms of physics. They are there. And you see. It goes from some, some of them which are astronomical, the Earth moving around the sun, to some of them which are very down, to, which are much closer to us. For instance, uh, you have, uh, yes, uh, things like clouds, for instance, are very important, believe it or not. Clouds are very transient, but they influence a lot the reflection of light. And you have also biological activity and, of course, uh, emissions. So all these are factors. And if we want to understand the climate, we have to understand all of them together, right? Which is a huge challenge. Not only that, so this is, for instance, the carbon cycle. I have a picture, so you see everything is interconnected, and you have human activity, and you have the sun shining on it, and Earth coming from down. A very complicated system. And you also have to understand the economics. Because, for instance, you have to put in alternative climate policies. You can understand technological progress, so you can say that. But it's not just putting it in and running in the computer. Because you see, human beings react. So it's not that easy. So for instance, you, you have to, in, to factor in what I call the game of life. The game of life is the fact that individuals react individually. So here, for instance, I'm, I don't have time to talk. So you have a well-known problem, the free rider problem. The free rider problem is the following. If climate improves, it improves for everyone, including those who have done nothing about it. Right? So, it's, uh, so you don't have an incentive to act yourself because you expect others to do it. And in this situation, you can expect others to do it. And you can also expect future generations do it. They will do the job. And also, you have less obvious thing, what I call the bouncing back, for instance. We are, we're all saying, well, let's have, let's have cars that have better mileage. Well, sure. But you see, the bouncing back phenomenon is well known. I mean, if cars have less mileage, it doesn't mean that they will consume less. Because people may drive more with a better conscience. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well known in economics. So you have 
What I'm trying to convey here, it is a very complicated landscape. Lots of people work about it, and it's a very nice challenge for mathematicians. However, as I told you, you don't have only mathematicians who work uh, landscape painters. You also have a mathematician can also create a world of his own, which may be of interest for even for others. He can bring you into new worlds that distracts you from the problem of this one. And here is a case. I started with an old master. Now let me show you a new master, Benoit Mandelbrot, who died last year. Well, here is a set that is going, let's call it the new Euclidean geometry. So it's a picture that's going to replace the triangle. So it is this picture. I'm sorry for the, revolu res the resolution, but this is a very strange set. It looks like something with warts. And indeed, but the problem here, I want to, to call attention to the shape of the ward. The ward here is precisely the same as the ward here. And if you, you're going to see that it has warts here and warts here and warts here. And uh, we're going to see a picture where you zoom in on the warts and you see that they all coming out. It is an impossible picture because it cannot happen in physics. In physics, at some point, you stop at the atoms. But here, you can go forever and ever and ever and the mathematics will continue. These are computer-generated pictures. So this is the world of Benoit Mandelbaum. Thank you, Eva. <laughs> Thanks, Eva. Uh, a founding member and past director of the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Physics, Dick Bond has played a lead role in making Canadian cosmology the global leader it is today. Dick has received I think almost every major Canadian award for science there is, and many international awards as well. He is an officer of the Order of Canada, a fellow of the, of the Royal Society of London and of Canada, as well as a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. Since 2002, he has been the director of CIFAR's research program in cosmology and gravity. The program is studying some of the most fundamental human questions, what are the origins of our universe, how did it evolve, and what is its ultimate fate. Together, CIFAR researchers from across Canada, the US, and Europe are working on many of the world's most influential projects. As we celebrate a partnership this morning, it's important to note that this CIFAR program has been meeting regularly at the Banff Centre, sometimes with Burrs, since 1985 when CIFAR founder Fraser Mustard and Banff Centre President uh, Paul Fleck recognized the importance of working together. Uh, out of these meetings have come significant 
uh, understandings, uh, advances rather, in our understanding of the universe. In the next 15 minutes, Dr. Bond will take us on a brief uh, journey through our Milky Way and the complex web of galaxies, stars, and planets to the deepest regions of space where the oldest light is remarkably simple. It's kind of like one of your relatives uh, providing a glimpse into the earliest moments of the universe. Would you give a warm welcome, please, to Dr. Bond? I was most recently here in uh, February, where we had our last annual meeting for the CIFAR program. And I was here at that 1985 meeting. And the questions that we ask now are very similar to the big questions we asked then. And we're still at it. There was no collaboration with Ivar, but what a brilliant ending he gave. Because the theme of my talk is the so obvious complexity of existence that we see around us, and that does persist as we look out into the universe. But it also turns out to have grown from something that was very simple. But let me also say that Mandelbrot sets those beautiful images, that movie we just saw, is also a very simple thing because it unfolds from a simple mathematical algorithm, and all of that beauty, all of that wonder, all of that structure is just an unfolding of that algorithm and the information that's required to uh, define that algorithm is extremely small, and that's really what we mean by simplicity, at least for this talk. As we look out into the universe, we are bounded, because information flows to us and it has a maximum speed, that is the speed of light, that is one of the great learnings we have uh, uh, found from Mother Nature. And we have never been able to find that there's any violation of the speed of light constraint. However, we can take the mathematics that we derive from that limited flow of information and we can then project and create not artificial worlds as in the Mandelbrot set, but we can understand at depth the real world and the entire universe and how it grew from its earliest moments to later. And that is the boundless thought of man. We can break out of the speed of light constraint. I'm going to begin by a quote this is a Walt Whitman quote and contains much of the theme, and it brings us here in this room. To me, every hour of the light and dark is a miracle. Every cubic inch of space is a miracle. So I want to imagine us being outside in the brilliant Banff sunshine with the very clear air up here. And just consider what is passing through a teaspoon of that air at any one time. Well, as you know, it's mostly oxygen and nitrogen relatively densely packed together. What is missing, although there is some, obviously, hydrogen and helium, which are by far the most abundant elements of the universe, but uh, the Earth can't capture all of that, whereas the sun is pr primarily hydrogen and helium. But I want to point to two elements that are there, here, the dark. And this is a discovery which we have made over the past 30 years, the dark energy aspect only in the last uh, 15 years. Um, the stuff that holds galaxies together we call dark matter. The stuff that defines the evolution of the universe at large now we call dark energy. What is the meaning of that word dark? The meaning of the word dark is that we don't understand it. However, we know a lot about its effect on gravity, and that is what its controlling influence is. But then we can contrast this with the light, the other theme of the uh, Whitman comment. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about the information that comes to us, flows from us, the f to us, the first light of the universe. And in every uh, cubic centimeter, there are a few thousand 
there are, every, uh, there are 400 of those light particles that are passing through. Uh, they're in the microwave, and uh, they're just with us. And you can actually detect them if you ever had a old television set with vacuum tubes. That's one of the causes of snow. Then there is a mystery beyond all mysteries, the one that underlies everything, and it is ridiculously called the vacuum because it is decidedly not a vacuum, it is alive with interaction, and I won't say more about it because that would cause hours and hours of discussion, except that it is a controlling influence. All of mass is determined by it, and it turns out little fluctuations in this strange thing, which too exist in this room with us, uh, are these fluctuations in the vacuum, and our grand design is the, the entire universe formed all of the structure formed from something that began as fluctuations in that medium. So I'm going to show you a number of pictures, but just to orient you, we come back to the Earth. And the reason I'm showing you this is not to remind you of the beautiful place we live at, but to actually show you a way of projecting the Earth onto a football, more or less, uh, with obviously the South Pole and the North Pole and the two edges are joined together, and so you're just uh, essentially opening it up like an orange. And that's because I want to show you some astronomical images. So here we are. Uh, this has got 600,000 stars in it, almost a billion, although five, half a billion, actually. Uh, all of those little dots there are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And you can see that they're concentrated in some sort of disk-like entity. That's where we live. And just to give you orientation, because we're looking at um, angles here, as is true when we look at the surface of the Earth. It's like a celestial sphere that we're looking at. And just to orient you, there are a few uh, uh, familiar things. Sagittarius A won't be familiar, but that's the center of our galaxy. This is another way of looking at the galaxy in three dimensions. And uh, as you can see, we have the sun there, and we are part way out in this great spiral galaxy. And one of the great discoveries with the dark matter is in fact that it extends far beyond that visible portion that you see of the stars that are whizzing around the center of the galaxy, far beyond, by a factor of about three. That is the dark matter that holds that galaxy together and turns out to be fundamental. Otherwise, our galaxy would fly apart. But this is another way of looking at the Milky Way in different emissions. These are emissions in radio waves and in microwaves and in long wavelength infrared radiation. And it is truly beautiful. And uh, all of this complex emission is an indication of complex uh, processes. But look up at the top. Those little uh, red and yellow bits, that is the primordial light, the light that comes to us from the earliest moments of the universe, and that is the subject of our discussion right now. That is the light, and it tells us about the dark, as I have said. That image was an image that uh, comes from the Planck satellite, which is a European Space Agency satellite, but Canada and CIFAR are very much involved in unraveling the information that has come to us. I was there at the launch in 2009. We've been working on it for more than 20 years. It was launched from French Guiana on an Ariane 5 rocket, which is truly an awesome thing to hear. Even five kilometers away, which we were restricted by, it just shakes the ground around you. It's a wonderful experience. The heart is pounding, not just because of the magnitude of what one's seeing, but that 20 years of one's life is associated with success in the launch. So this is what happened in March 21 of this year. We unveiled the primordial light that was below all of those Milky Way emissions with various forms of processing. And it tells us about the primordial structure of the universe when it was a factor of about a thousand smaller in size. It's an expanding universe. And I'm going to use the concept of scale 
Well, I'm first of all going to say we made a media splash with this, a media splash which was outrageous and wonderful. So if you uh, Google Planck Satellite 2013 results, there are about a million links. A large fraction of the, a very large fraction of those are actually media stories about the launch. All over the world, everybody picked up on this story. Uh, the Globe and Mail, I'm very happy to say, was uh, one of the first because uh, uh, one of their reporters is uh, uh, an old friend of we and CIFAR and the Canadian Institute for theoretical astrophysics and was well prepared for this. The Canadian involvement includes the Canadian Space Agency, the University of Toronto, University of British Columbia, the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, but in particular our topic today being the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. As well, it made headlines all over the world. There's a Le Monde one and there's a New York Times one and many, many, many more. So, I wanted to talk and set the stage for how we're looking out at things in terms of scale. So scale and uh, the, the curious font for scale is to show that the universe is expanding. It was initially in a more compressed state and that it has passed to a less compressed state. And uh, for scale, we will use one arbitrarily meeting now. And when that first light of the universe was released from matter, and its strongly interaction with matter, the universe was 1,100 times smaller in uh, scale, and that means it was about a billion times denser than the average out there in the universe now. The picture you see, the very beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, all of those little uh, beautiful entities are galaxies, and most of them are at uh, a time when the scale was about a quarter of the size, so looking very far back, but not nearly as far back as uh, when this first light was uh, uh, sent out. Uh, there were no galaxies when the universe was about a 20th of the size at all, and we call the time between when that first light was released and the first galaxies formed uh, the dark ages. Again, dark because we don't know that much about it because it's hard to observe. So I now want to talk about the information that's in this beautiful picture. Once again, it turns out that although it looks relatively complicated, it's actually very simple. The um, yellows uh, and reds are noting slightly higher temperatures, I mean in micro degrees. Uh, and the blues are, uh, are uh, slightly colder temperatures, and there's structure in that. But that structure can be characterized by only about seven numbers. So once again, there is an algorithm in which you encode a huge amount of information about the early universe, its simplicity personified. And a way to hear that, as opposed to seeing that, is uh, what you will get in the following. This is doing an analysis, a harmonic analysis of all of the structure in that. Uh, amplifying the frequency by 10 to the 20th to make it audible to you. And what do you hear? The sound of the machine. What machine? The machine that creates all of the structure around us in the universe. It unfolds from information in these seven numbers. That information is like classical music. All parts of the audible spectrum are used. And that's what classical music does. It dense packs the uh, information in sound. Except what you heard was essentially noise, so it isn't as melodious. Uh, one of the great discoveries of Planck, much celebrated, was that there's a little bit more bass than there is treble in that uh, nearly classical music. And with that information, of that little more bass than treble. We can evolve the universe forward. This is showing what it looks like with 60,000 galaxies nearby. It exhibits complexity, uh, which is uh, what we affectionately call the cosmic web. Everything is interconnected. That's one of the themes of uh, 
the complexity and simplicity, which is the interconnection of all things, and that is true in the universe itself. So there are basic structures like filaments, voids, and superclusters. And we can simulate this. And this is an example of a simulation, a beautiful thing, uh, that shows you the cosmic web. And the remarkable thing is that armed with those seven numbers, we can do detailed forward-moving simulations that agree with incredible accuracy relative to what we observe. That is to say, we can start with extreme simplicity and understand how everything came into being. It doesn't mean that we can solve things like all of the details of the formation of human beings. That's for other CIFAR programs to tackle. So everything grew from simplicity to complexity under the spirit of gravity. Okay, so that has been the theme from compl complexity to simplicity to complexity to simplicity. I haven't described the to simplicity and uh, the from uh, complexity. And now I will give you a uh, artistic version of this, like a painting. So do not get startled by the details. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? We have a bunch of images and there is a flow pattern to those images, those little arrows which take us from the ultra, ultra early moments of the universe through a whole sequence of stages through to the ultimate end of the universe. And with the tremendous hubrisness of physicists, namely me and my <laughs> confreres, we actually, with a straight face, can tell you that we think we are on the right track for understanding the evolution of the universe from the ultra early moments. And as I explained to you at the beginning, we have uh, a fundamental speed of light constraint. And that uh, constraint does not bound our imagination. And so we compute what things must look like far, far, far beyond. And so that's this sort of multi-universe picture that you see there. And the ultimate end, we're supposed to be a galaxy and everything else has moved very, 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 very far away from us, an isolated ending. Not such a happy story, but we sure don't know that for sure. So the sequence of things that we've learned is a sequence of let there be's. The stuff in red is stuff that we've talked about and uh, going from the early universe to the late universe with just that kind of stuff that's here in this room in the air that dominates. And a question, which I won't have time to go into, but you should bear in mind, is with, we now use the word for the universe at large, the word eternal or semi-eternal. And so that's so much against the old idea of one single Big Bang where everybody thinks of a firecracker going off. That is not the current vision. There has been a radical transformation. And so I want to end with a wonderful quote from T.S. Eliot because it uh, tells us uh, um, what, what we're doing this all about. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Uh, we now have about 15 minutes uh, to ask some questions about what we've just heard um, and to anchor uh, this discussion and what happens here at the BAMP Center. Um, I'd also like to ask Jeff Melanson to uh, join us on stage. So if Ivar and Dick could come up here, we'll get right into this. Uh, I now understand why I failed physics. <laughs> I'm also astonished, or actually not astonished really, to learn that the universe is, is both older and fatter than we expected. What else is new? <laughs> <laughs> what, what does, maybe Ivar, I could start with you. This is incredibly complex stuff. I mean, I've heard an estimate there are 100 people in Canada who understand this, maybe 1,000 people in the world who understand the mathematics and the science of this. So what does mathematics have to teach us? And by us, I mean Jeff and me, and, and not you know, a few people in the audience. What is it about the fragility of the planet we inhabit? How can we grasp 
the simplicity of that lesson in, in the complexity of those numbers? Well, the, you, I, I hope I've showed the complexity, I mean the many factors that influence uh, uh, the Earth and so on. So we don't understand everything. So we know we don't understand everything, so, our, uh, so we cannot predict in a very precise way. But we can show that uh, there are upsides, there are scenarios, there are upsides and downsides. So uh, the, the so the the math we have the mathematics will tell you that uh, many things can happen, and one has to be careful. I would say that perhaps, and also there is a way of looking ahead. You see, with don't know everything, but with all this help we have, I think there are more than 100 people who understand that. You know, people get educated, things that seem difficult to us are simpler for the younger generation and so on. I think there are more people who understand, and there is help out there. We can have models, we can run scenarios. We do not understand everything, but we need this kind of help. We need the models, we need the math, and ultimately, you cannot touch on human freedom. You know, what you cannot, ultimately you will rely on human freedom. I mean, mathematics will never be able to predict what people actually do. That is not a possibility. People are free, they do what they want. But uh, I have to say that's a bit of a problem. Uh, uh, n yeah? For instance, I, I, I'm looking over your work. Um, uh, at one point you say there's a 50% chance, yeah? uh, like a one in two chance, that the polar, the North Pole ice cap will completely liquefy and melt, and that's within the next 50 years or so. Oh, yes, so you have... Uh, so, at the same time, you say you can't predict uh, whether the you know, thermohaline convection, the thing that runs the, the Gulf Stream, you, you can't predict whether that is going to reverse itself. So there's things you can know, there's things you can't know. Meanwhile, there are people, I mean, I don't mean to pick on Calgary, but there are people mm -hmm. in Calgary who are saying, you know, it's uncertain what's ha happening with the climate. We, we really don't have to be concerned about that. Then there are other people saying, such as you and your recent work on sustainability, that we really... So my, my question is, how can I... Who do I turn to to give me an answer? And can I look to mathematics and mathematicians to give me some certainty? Cl climate science is not only mathematicians, right? You have lots of people, you have physicists, you have biologists, you have teams out there. We know more and more and new information comes in. The predictions are quite dire. What you said, the World Bank is out there with prediction, the uh, International Energy Agency, they're talking of mean temperature in the Mediterranean rising by nine degrees. So it looks grim, right? This is certain. But what, I, what we, are, we are saying is that there is a lot of obstacles out there against doing something because you cannot, uh, I mean, people can look at the evidence and look away. This is just a possibility, you know, the, uh, it's your choice. Uh, it, it, I think that we're more risk-averse as individuals than risk-averse as a society, that we would accept risk for society, we would not accept for ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So I, I can tell you there's a, a friend of mine saying, if I bike, I am on the top of a mountain and prepare to go down. If I meet someone who's coming up and tells me there's oil on the road, I will slow down, <laughs> clearly, because I'm risk averse. Now, here we are, scientists telling you there is oil on the road. Will you slow down? Individuals would do it. Societies apparently have reasons not to do it because they're conflicted interests, uh, things of that kind. But the, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the evidence is out there, right? This is clear. In other words, we run scenarios and so on, and uh, there, is a, there is some upside. Things might be better than we expect, but uh, more and more evidence accumulates. Right now, it's going faster than we thought, right? They're saying there will be no more ice caps uh, in summer in 2030. So clearly, uh, it's, it's more and more certain. There are philosophers who say that the, the flaw in the human species is that we cannot plan for the future. We just, because we collectively don't, don't see any is there a, Is there a mathematics that predicts the likelihood of us saving ourselves? No, because again, it goes back to the freedom of people. People can do, I mean, 
the human species has gone into wars, right? Remember the First World War. Europe committed suicide in, uh, the, between 1914 and 1920. We're still suffering from it. There's no rationale for that. Now, you wonder why people did it. They did it. So, uh, you see, I have some French biologists and say that as a species, we are not equipped for this kind of long-range planning. You see, you also have this very particular thing about climate that we're doing things now which will have effect only in 50 to 100 years, right? When most people today will not be alive. I will not suffer from climate change, right? So this is new for us. We're asking politicians to do things. The voters are not even born yet. The voters will gain from it. They're not born. I think Stephen Harper has that under control, though. <laughs> he, he's, he has already planned for those people. But I think myself, that uh, I think myself that there's more in people than just biology and so on. So, and there, is, there are grassroots movements out there. So, happily, we cannot predict. I mean, it is people are free. This is, uh, they're creative, they are free. They, uh, uh, yeah. I think also that institutions, we, fundamentally, I think the institu institutions we have are not adapted to the problem. We deal with it as nations. But nations are there to defend their own citizens. This is what they were created for. It is a problem for the whole human species. We need something else. We need new kind of institutions. But this is my personal view. Mm -hmm. Dick, your research seems to suggest that T.S. Eliot uh, a quote that you have at the end, uh, that is also the end of uh, 2001, a space odyssey. You know, we'll never cease from exploration. At the end of our exploring, we arrive back where we started. We know the place for the first time. So it sounds like what that poetry and fiction and, and art have come to the same conclusion as astrophysics. Um, in a different way. Uh, that both endeavors involve a high degree of creativity is definitely the case. Uh, the return to looking at the world now with all of the knowledge we've amassed with new eyes, I think is uh, definitely, it's the full uh, theme for science. It is a deeper, deeper look at things that are familiar to us that feeds back on your question about, uh, about the nature of the Earth. But there is, I think, a deep connection of uh, the journey of a scientist with the jour intellectual journey, with the journey of a poet, the journey of a writer who is a futurist like Arthur C. Clarke, which is that all of the journeys begin internally and you try and make the connection to the external world and then bring that back to relook and re-know yourself in the Greek dictum of know thyself. Do you as a cosmologist, I mean, these concerns of Ivar, do you hear Ivar speaking and you think, well, in the big picture, Ivar's toast anyway. So, uh, uh, as are most, and I'm not trying to be flippant about yeah, this. No, 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 sure, sure. You know, sure. We're all dead as somebody famously remarked. As a cosmologist, does that give you, when you see the bigger picture, does it give you some, some solace of some sort? You mean that all goes poof at some point? Well, that it's we all, can it's all operating predict the ultimate future of this uh, not very great beginning. The thing that is we have to marvel at is that We've really, since the discovery of writing, we've only been operating in amassing this information, and we've come so far. And I would not like to overbound where we can go to on the basis of the current science knowledge we have. I know many colleagues are almost doctrinaire about, sure, we know how all futures are going to unfold. For me, I like the concept of I believe in everything and nothing, and the nothing aspect says anything can happen. And we don't know uh, for sure. All we know is with probabilities. This comes back, again, to the fundamental mathematical issue. We can project probabilities. Some things we can't project with certainty. And we operate our lives by this. And so that, I think, is uh, where, where you have some prior 
information or knowledge, you update it with your experience, and then you go into the future to try and say, this is what I am going to do, and this is what uh, we are going to do as a planet. So uh, I think, I, I like to be optimistic about the future, and um, it does seem that the mechanistic vision associated with physics is everything, which I have ascribed through my whole operating career, it's unbelievably successful. Unbelievably successful. Is that all there is? I don't know. Everybody's got an opinion. That's where we have a boundary between one's own philosophical insight and then the information that we've gathered. And you get to interpret the information we've gathered in whatever way you wish. What you shouldn't deny is the information. And that also goes back to you know, making sure that our, uh, our beautiful planet Earth is going to keep motoring along. Mm -hmm. so, so the but, it will get, but it will get killed by the sun at some point. We'll have to be off of the planet at some point. And people are even trying to do it. I was at SpaceX. His goal, this is the guy in SpaceX, that his real goal is to take humans to Mars. I mean, it's, you know, like total space cadet. And yet, you know, that's the vision that is driving his whole uh, operation, which is to say, we want to go far. Humans must be able to propagate out one way or another in the galaxy. We should not let, by our own fault, things come to an end. Mm -hmm. I would like to, I'd like to add something. This was a very short presentation, right? Mm -hmm. But there are other aspects to the Earth. We're talking mainly about the physics. But at our scale, there is also life, you see? At our scale, life is important, and how society operates are important as well, and they'll be as important for the future of the planet as the physics, you see? And now, life in itself it has different rules in a sense. Life, that's a con life has a dilemma, conflict, and cooperation. Every living thing has this dilemma, you know? Living things reproduce and eat. Now, to reproduce is cooperation. You need cooperation. You have to eat. Now, that is conflict. The guy who's eaten doesn't like it. So this is a fundamental dilemma of life, and uh, which is not resolved in a physical way, right? It is very different. It is uh, uh, what I call the game of life. And the game of life is, goes to society as well. You see in society where things that are good for the individual May, very bad, may be very bad for society. So all this is running the show as well in the case of Earth, and it will be also, and this is why we cannot, perhaps we could predict the physics, right? But the outcome of the game of life, this we cannot predict. Mm. I remember reading an essay by Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And he, it was a, a nonfiction essay, and. He said um, that these space probes we keep sending on the Voyager, Discovery, that they are really the very first uh, iterations. They're the, the first examples of silicon-based life forms, and that they are our future uh, form of us, that they're the very first insect-like protoplasmic things crawling out of the ocean as, as we were you know, a million years ago, that these are the first form of us in the future, that we will not exist as carbon-based life form. We'll be silicon-based, and they'll take over. And I thought, you know, I've, I've got these two geniuses here. I might as well ask them if there's anything real about that vision. The, what will happen to humanity in not just the machine age, but the computer age, you, we, we have no ability to forecast what's going to happen because it's all changed so rapidly over our short time. And to contemplate 5,000 years downstream where we will be, our consciousness, assuming we survive, will be presumably integrated completely with computers. That is to say, our thinking power will be amplified enormously. It already is. It already is. We are connected to our external devices, and they have become part of us. And to 
not recognize that we are moving so far beyond in that. So then there's an interesting question of whether consciousness or its essence can actually be uh, injected into a machine. And of course, we've all seen the movies with their tales of this, some bad, some good. I think that such concepts are actually quite inevitable. That is, the, what, what's happened, the world, humanity, is the human web that's totally in, interconnected. We haven't got that tail right right now. There's a huge amount of noise. But we're also buzzing together. And what will happen to the human entity as we further and further integrate with uh, the uh, huge uh, cloud, if you like, but a mega cloud far beyond anything that we see now. I mean, it could be for evil or it could be for fabulous good in terms of a kind of collective human conscience which will have all of these uh, uh, materialistic components like the silicon. I think that when Clark, I don't know what date that was, he was, in spite of being a fabulous futurist, he was probably bounded by his imagination of that time because he couldn't project where we are now, which is amazing even for when that would have been written. And then where we're gonna go, it's, it, it's it, what an adventure we're on. And uh, one of the things that we should be just very enthusiastic about, in spite of the fact that mostly people are dealing with the angst of the next crisis, is the remarkable transition, the revolution that we have had over these years. And to suppose that that revolution isn't just gonna keep going on and on and on and change the nature of humanity fundamentally and hopefully for the good, hopefully for the recognition that because of the interconnectivity, we have to get all of our problems under control and, uh, and have this hopefully, uh, if I were to hope, it would be for a kind of advanced consciousness, which everybody would participate in, not in a negative sense, but in the sense of uh, uh, everybody seeing some kind of collective good as, as beings. But the, there is no guarantee of a conscience in the, in the math. Oh, no, no, oh, well, it's always a question. Does math exist out there or is it in our minds? That's an old question. I just, uh, but I wanted to add something, certainly. Um, yes, on the one hand, certainly after the, hum the human beings have been submitted to uh, the standard laws of nature up to industrial revolution. From the industrial revolution on, we freed ourselves basically from the law of nature, you know, Malthus law, uh, famines and so on that was over now, we really have this spaceship concept, which I believe in. We, I think now, as human beings, we understand we are in that spaceship. Now, I don't have much to add to what you say, except perhaps that I wonder, I see my, uh, my grandchildren and so on, they all have this handle device and so on, and they talk to their friends like that. And if I were a science fiction writer, I could imagine all humanity being there, I wonder what in our brains does it that we're so fascinated with screens, you see? You like to watch on TV, think that which are happening before you, you wouldn't care about. So there is something then, perhaps you, perhaps there's something in our mind that we'll all connect through that and we'll be like cells, you know, our body that made by individual cells that group together and perhaps will co coalesce into a, some kind of a super human being, all connected, I don't know. See? Why not? I mean, yeah, the, you know, all these guys, they, oh, instead of talking to each so other, they talk to the computer. Okay. So my cell phone is not just my master, it's also my grandchild. <laughs> and that's what you're saying. It is much more your grandchild yeah. than yourself. You want to I predict the price of gas next month or anything like that? <laughs> uh, so this brings me, Jeff, to, to, to you. I mean, the, obviously, these are massive concepts, complex ones, hard to understand, hard for everyday uh, non-specialists to understand. So what role does the uh, artistic notion of, of creativity play in these fields? I mean, what does a place like the Banff Center do for 
How does it use this thinking? <clears throat> I was worried for a second you're intervening on my iPhone usage, so uh, <laughs> thank you for that. And it's nice to be part of the non-genius bookends of this discussion. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Um, I think the notion, one of the challenges on artistic creativity is this notion that it's a very special thing you're born with or not. And really, I think in our view, in my view, artistic creation is fundamental to everybody. And professional artists take fundamental human skills, human, the, the way we exist as human beings, the way we try to create meaning and take it to the highest level. So first and foremost, everybody's an artist. And sort of trying to create that connection so we're not looking at this dramatically siloed approach is key. Um, what artists do well, as we saw last night with Shane Coison's talk, is take stories and narrative and infuse them with meaning in a way that they can make a difference. So in my conversations with uh, Nusif Kasub, who's the, uh, the head of Burrs and Alan Bernstein at CIFAR, part of the attraction of the BAMP Center is this notion that we can bring the scientific community together with the arts community to try to frame this narrative in a way that it, it, it's impactful. And in terms of moving the needle on some of these big, important social issues, I think that's pretty critical. And I think the final piece is, you know, we, we established our culture, our society, our universities with the intent that people would work together across disciplines. And that doesn't happen, like the way the university is structured, the way our industries are structured, and so on. And so our belief is the problems facing the world are complex enough that, that we cannot afford to approach them in a very siloed approach that leaves people out of the discussion. Mm. But, but why Banff? I mean, what does Banff bring to CIFAR and, and Burrs that say, dare I mention it, Toronto or, or New York or, you know, even Paris, so Dr. Eklund doesn't have to travel quite so far? Well, compared to Toronto, I think our mayor is a little bit more favorably disposed to what we're doing. <laughs> Um, so that's a yeah, sort of dig you on a past life. You would have to bring that up. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, Couldn't resist that one. Um, so certainly Dick could talk, having been here since 1985, could speak to this, but what we see uh, across the science and artistic spheres is Banff allows people to deep dive. They get away from their devices. Uh, for a lot of artists and a lot of scientists we talk to here, the interaction with the mountain causes them to think really big and also puts them into perspective in the universe in a way that you often don't find in cities. And I think this opportunity for people to deep dive within their disciplines and interact with so many people from so many different countries and different perspectives is a huge value add. Of course, the mountains are pretty nice as well. Can I add something to that? The operative word is deep because we live in a world of the multifoliation of knowledge has been such that everybody is a tiny little cog in a mega move, which is this great vision that we were talking about. But what you have to be able to do is to go very deep, even in your little cog. And what you should discover in that little region is a truth that exists in the, in the broad as well, if you like. It's the zen of each uh, element in this large thing. And with the speed of change, the barrage of information, I decry the fact that we have lost the ability to really go deep. And deep is needed if you're going to do uh, cross-discipline, because usually it's just two languages that can't really talk to each other. So I think that that's a role that uh, the BAMP Center is exceptional at. It is something that you actually need to do further work on, because you have to handhold we scientists to take us. And that was actually done just yesterday here when with Rebecca Finley there, we sat down with one of your media experts here and they made my talk a lot better than you, it would have been, however you thought it was, as it was. But it was a wonderful experience to go one-on-one -on -one with that artistic element and that's the sort of thing that, shall I say, we went deep yesterday. Hmm. Well, thank you both, uh, very, all three of you, in fact, uh, very much for, your, um, for taking the time uh, to come here. Uh, Ivar Eklund is the former director of the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, one of the partners behind the Banff International Research Station, as I mentioned. Uh, Dick Bond has been the director of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research's Cosmology and Gravity Program since 2002. Jeff Melanson, as you know, is the president of the Banff Center. Uh, our thanks again to the Midsummer Ball lead print sponsor, The Globe and Mail, uh, and uh, to all of you for joining us uh, so early in the morning. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for coming and have a great afternoon. <laughs>